In this week's drive, we try really hard to hold on to it. Go testing in a car which will never be raced. Go back to the future in Kenya. And see something really unusual from Germany. All this and more in this week's Drive. A1 Grand Prix headed to its spiritual home for the sixth round. The driving force behind the series, Sheikh Maktoum Hasha Maktoum Al Maktoum, is the nephew of the Crown Prince of Dubai. And since 1992, Dubai has been the final staging post for the Class 1 Powerboat World Championship and is home to several of the teams. So it was logical that the car drivers would have a look at the 45-foot monsters capable of 165 miles an hour on water. A couple of them were given the opportunity to drive one of the powerboats around the course that will host the last race of the Class 1 Championship. A1 Team Britain's Robbie Kerr was amongst them. Negotiator is the British entry in Class 1 and is driven by Chris Parsonage and Randy Sism at the throttle. Robbie Kerr took to the wheel and Chris replaced Randy at the throttle of the two 8-litre Lamborghini engines. <laughs> 25-year-old Catherine Legg is one of a handful of female top-class open-wheeler racing drivers. She scored three victories in this year's North American Toyota Atlantic Series Championship. And Catherine also got the chance to pilot Negotiator. After completing his run, Robbie gave his reaction to reaching speeds of 140 miles an hour on water. It felt tremendously stable, but you're just floating across the water and uh, occasionally a little wobble as it went over a wave or two, but no, it's... Uh, Really good experience, and one I'd uh, jump at doing again. Sort of swing around on A1 the back, Team Britain would break around. new ground when it sent Catherine out in its car. The squad, headed by ex world champion John Surtees, will be the first to field a female driver. The past few weeks have seen her hit the headlines by becoming the first female driver to try a Formula One car for more than a decade when she tested a Minardi, crashing on her second lap before setting competitive times the next day. Paul Stoddard offered me the, the Formula One test in the Minardi, so that was awesome. So I went and did that, which went really well in, in the end. Um, and now I've got the opportunity to drive this before I head straight from here to Sebring to do the, the Champ car. So I get to test the, the A1 GP car, the Champ car, and, and the Formula One car in the space of two months, which uh, can't really get any better, can it? Falconry has been an integral part of desert life for centuries. Originally practiced for hunting, this traditional custom also reflects the Bedouin love of sport. Brazilian Nelson Piquet was given a chance to share in this Arab passion before practice began at the Dubai Autodrome. Once into her overalls, Catherine Legg attracted a great deal of attention. She clocked up 17 laps, setting the 22nd quickest time. The British team were pleased with her performance and stressed that lap times were low on their list of priorities as Catherine needed to bed in the brakes and a new engine. Team France have been the benchmark with eight consecutive race wins this season and Nicolas Lapierre proved once again that he's the man to beat, delivering the fastest lap of the day ahead of the final qualifying session. We've had an excellent session today. We worked hard on the car, but the track also improved during the practice session. We're in with another good chance of winning. The setup of the car is looking good for us. So I'm very happy with the way things have gone. Irish former Jordan Formula One driver Ralph Furman is quickly coming to terms with the A1 Grand Prix package. Furman finished third in Portugal, and another strong showing looked likely after he posted the third quickest time. Uh, obviously, first time here. It's a fantastic circuit and enjoyed racing today. And also, it's good that the tyres held together today. We were um, able to keep the one set of tyres and be able to improve the car um, through the day, which is fantastic, which is helping us hopefully close the gap on Nicholas. They've been uh, pretty dominant this year. and. Uh... Enrico Toccacello has failed to deliver despite his experience. However, that looked about to change as he set the fifth fastest time for Team Italy. 
Thomas Enger, driving for the Czech Republic A1 team, put in another consistent performance and posted the second fastest time to finish behind LaPierre. Philip Giebler debuted for Team USA with a formidable reputation in karting. Saturday's qualifying session was curtailed due to an early accident. Salvador Duran, back in the car for Team Mexico, tried to drive through a slight error but failed to save the spin. The resulting smash badly damaged the car and the incident led to the cessation of the first qualifying session, with only four teams registering lap times. After exploding out of the traps in the season-opening race at Brands Hatch, Team Brazil have experienced more than their fair share of ill fortune. However, that bad luck might be behind them as Nelson Piquet steered his car into fourth spot on the grid. Team Ireland's Furman underlined the degree to which the Irish are coming to terms with the A1 car. A third spot on the grid was just a reward for some very hard work. Team Switzerland's Neil Yanni, who had shown impressive pace all weekend, kept everything together through qualifying and claimed his second successive pole position. Yanni also claimed pole in Sepang in Malaysia for the fifth leg of the 12-event A1 GP only to finish second to France's Premier in both the sprint and the feature races. Team France had, by their standards, a disastrous day. The French team, who've alternated between Nicolas Lapierre and Alexandre Premier, have won eight races in a row to claim a 27-point lead over Switzerland. But they didn't get a run at all in session one, and then Lapierre fell off the track in session two after going too wide. Afterwards, Yanni seemed pleased with his position. Uh, finally, we got the car there where we wanted, and uh, also I did not do any mistakes. Uh, we had three very difficult free practice sessions, but uh, luckily we got it together for the qualifying. Two fantastic laps from Lapierre in the final sessions were good enough for yet another front row start in second spot. The Swiss would be wary of the French team as Lapierre was aiming for his fifth straight win in five starts. But in the longer feature race, Switzerland retained the pole and took the lead, having claimed victory in the earlier sprint race. Italy was in second place, and Indonesia raced through from sixth on the grid to third place. But British driver Robbie Kerr recovered from a collision with the Czech Republic to pass Indonesia. Then Frenchman Lapierre found a way past Indonesia on lap three. And then the Indonesians' run came to a premature end with a spin. Lapierre had earlier done exactly the same thing in the sprint race, but avoided damaging the car to finish seventh. Switzerland and Italy lost time during pit stops. And as a result of being overly hasty trying to get back out in a hurry, the Swiss earned a drive-through penalty for speeding in the pit lane, leaving Britain and France to battle for the lead. Eventually, Yanni would be forced to retire the Swiss car with mechanical failure. Eventually, Robbie Kerr's tyres appeared to show signs of wear, and Lapierre took his chance to grab the advantage and move to the front, giving the British team its third second-place finish in six feature races. The French win was their ninth in 12 starts, and they now have 106 points at the halfway stage of the 12-leg inaugural season. Switzerland remains a distant second on 75, and Brazil, despite a poor weekend for them, stay third with 60. Britain jump one place to fourth ahead of New Zealand, followed by Portugal and the luckless Irish. South Africa, who will host the eighth leg of the A1 Grand Prix in Durban from the 27th to the 29th of January, received a boost when Stephen Simpson posted a surprise podium finish with third place. And the race was just crazy, fantastic, fantastic pit stop, good strategy. Everything went really fine, the car was, was fantastic and we just do it, so I'm, I'm very pleased. With the gap of, after the restart I pulled, we thought we could uh, get away quite well and we did. Um, kept the gap pretty similar to what it was, but unfortunately the tyres just gave up a little bit and uh, France were able to catch us up, so very disappointed, but a good result and uh, starting from nights on the grid 
carving our way through the first few laps. It was really exciting. Uh, just really, really happy. I mean, the last few races have been quite difficult for us, but we've been making progress, and I think the A1 formula is it's so close at the moment. It's only getting closer. So, I mean, in qualifying, we qualified 13th, and uh, we're running at the front, obviously, in this race. So. I think the the whole championship it's it's really really close but uh, I mean this is just a great result for everybody back home all the support that I've got um, and building up to my home race on the 29th of January in Durban it's it's a, a brilliant result. Nelson Piquet parked his car beside the track and made a bit of motorsport history with a brand new method of race car recovery. The new helicopter recovery service was given the green light by the FIA for A1 Grand Prix to use for the first time in Dubai. There's a mid-season break, and then round seven of the A1 Grand Prix of Nations will be at Sentul in Indonesia on January the 15th. Fifty years after the first East Africa Safari Rally was established to mark the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, Competing crews and motorsport fans everywhere celebrated the return of the East Africa Safari Rally in 2003. The world's greatest classic rally traced its way once again through three East African countries, just as it did in 1953. The race would start in Kenya, travel into Uganda, through Tanzania, and ending back in Kenya. Not only that, but the event attracted world-famous drivers from the golden era of rallying, such as 1984 world champion Stich Blomqvist, four times world champion Juha Kankonen, and 79 world champ Bjorn Valdegaard. Kankonen was in a Datsun 240 this year. He won his titles driving for Peugeot, Lancia, and Toyota. In fact, the event was originally the Coronation Safari, but in 1960, the event was renamed the East Africa Safari Rally, running annually until 1972. In keeping with the sense of history, only cars produced before the 31st of December 1974 were eligible. Nowadays, the World Championship rallies are really small, sporty events. But this one is like uh, Safari used to be, long and, and, and good roads. No, I like it. It's, it's done in the old way, and, but uh, they have found really good roads around Kenya. Jorn Valdegaard was driving a Porsche 911 Carrera, more usually considered a road racing car than a rally car. But the venerable 911 acquitted itself well. Bjorn finished seventh, an hour and 16 minutes off the pace. But another Porsche would finish third, driven by Frederick Dorr. In fact, Bjorn's title was claimed behind the wheel of a Ford Escort and a most unlikely rally car, a Mercedes 450 SLC. Local spectators were glad to see the rally return, even if it's no longer part of the World Championship. One clearly preferred the older cars and was critical of more modern ones. It does give me good memories when motorsports was really a driver versus machine and it's something that cannot go out of our mind, you know. It's what we grew up with watching when we were kids up in the village. I'm so happy to see this again because by that time I was young as well like you. But so these cars are back again so the, be the best way I think is to bring some cars back again into life rather than bring cars which cannot even last than two years. On this legendary event, the cars covered 4,500 kilometers in 10 days. The crews headed north of Nairobi and into the famed Maasai Mara Game Reserve, home of the famous Maasai warrior tribe. The event was scheduled outside the International Rally calendar and during one of the most beautiful months in East Africa, and delivered yet more stunning and memorable action, underlining its status as one of the greatest classic car rallies of the modern era. Eventually, the all-Kenyan crew of Rob Collins and Anton Levitan claimed their second consecutive victory in the world's most historic rally. The Datsun 260Z crew took the lead after the third leg and finished the event back in Mombasa with nearly 26 minutes in hand. Stich Blomqvist, the earlier leader, finished second in a Ford Escort RS1600 with Frederick Dorr third overall. Meanwhile, double and current world champion Sebastian Loeb has given a positive response to Citroën's new C4 World Rally car after driving it for the first time. The development of the new C4 has started in earnest as the French Works team prepares for its return to competition in 2007. 
Although Loeb is set to defend his World Rally title in a privateer Citroën Zara run by Belgian outfit Kronos Racing, the Frenchman maintained his close links with the Citroën factory team by road testing the C4 on the asphalt roads in southern France. The Citroën factory team decided to take a year out of competitive rally racing, but preparations were already in full swing for their World Championship return in 2007. Loeb took the wheel of the new C4 in wet and tricky conditions, but reacted well to the feel and response of the car. Uh, it was uh, it was good. Uh, the feeling was uh, was okay. Uh, in the slow corner, the feeling is very good. Uh, the car is turning very easily in, and uh, a good grip at the exit. In the fast places, it's a bit moving too much for the moment. So. We have to, to find a, a solution to, to adapt that, but uh, no, it's OK. This wasn't the first outing for the C4. It actually made its first appearance in 2004, and then again midway in 2005, when it was expected to make its rally debut. But the withdrawal of Citroën from the World Rally Championship meant plans were put on ice. Now that Citroën have announced their intention to return to rallying in 2007, work on developing the car has started up again. I think in the slow corner it's okay. We just have to to find a bit some precision in the fast places, a bit more grip on the rear, and we try to work in this side. It's early days yet for the new contender, but the signs are already looking good. Probably the most famous V8 engine is the Chrysler Hemi. It's been around for over 40 years, but with high fuel prices, driving a 5.7-litre V8 is a bit insensitive. But what if you could shut down some of the cylinders, just feeding fuel into seven, six, five, or even just four cylinders when the engine's just cruising along? But instantly wake them up again when full power is needed. Chrysler calls this the multi-displacement system, and it seamlessly alternates between a smooth, high fuel economy four-cylinder mode when less power is needed, and V8 mode when the driver demands more power. The switch from eight to four cylinders and back occurs in 40 milliseconds, much faster than the blink of an eye, and can provide up to a 20% improvement in fuel economy. And now we'll see a couple of new cars from the cream of European motor manufacturers, starting with a second model variant of the new BMW 3 Series range. The Touring, the fourth generation of a 3 Series Touring or station wagon, is arriving in various markets around the world. The new 3 Series Touring offers practicality, better performance, great handling, and it's more comfortable, roomier, and is even more frugal at the pumps than the previous model. Inside and out, the new 3 Series Touring is larger than its predecessor. It's just a bit wider, longer and a squeak taller, with a longer wheelbase so front and rear occupants have more space and comfort. The new Touring model benefits from the new range of magnesium alloy engines first introduced on the 630i coupe and convertible. Using lightweight materials in the construction of the crankcase, crankcase bearings and the cylinder head cover makes it the lightest volume production six-cylinder engine in the world. All three series get a six-speed manual gearbox as standard or a six-speed automatic as an option. All six-cylinder Touring models have an enhanced traction control system as standard. The uprated system ensures the brakes are primed for faster emergency stops, they are wiped dry in wet conditions, and stop a manual car rolling backwards during a hill start. Although the new Touring was developed completely separately from its saloon counterpart, it's identical from the nose to the A-pillar, from there, the roof line tapers to the rear spoiler without any effect on rear seat headroom. The additional space in the Touring provides an ideal solution for families, with the car offering two child seat fixings in the rear seat and, as an option, one set on the front passenger seat. Rear seat passengers also get separate rear seat air conditioning and everyone can enjoy the optional huge panorama sunroof, which gives all passengers up to 60% more light than a regular sunroof. Some clever features in the boot ensure that any load can be transported safely. Like its predecessor, the new Touring features a split opening tailgate. The rear seat splits and folds to make the cargo bay as big as the loading dock on the Starship Enterprise. 
A useful underfloor storage box means small items can be transported safely. And in addition, a waterproof folding box beneath the boot floor provides storage for dirty items such as muddy boots without damaging other contents or the carpeting. There are two engines, the frugal 2-litre diesel and the six-cylinder 325, with 320-330i and 330d variants gradually becoming available. In America, the model will be known as the Sport Wagon and will initially be available as a 325xi model. The X-Drive all-wheel drive system gives extra traction and agility. The new 3 Series Sports Wagon family in the US will expand in 2006 with the rear-wheel drive versions. X-Drive will not be available in all markets. At home in Europe, a very large proportion of vehicles sold are wagons as they become lifestyle accessories. And it's not every big brown dog that has his own boat, BMW and chauffeur. And here we have the... what? Another minivan or MPV? It's a luxury six-passenger all-wheel drive vehicle with air suspension that can lift or lower its body through 70 millimeters. Give up? This is the new Mercedes-Benz R-Class, which the company insists has no rivals and is in a class of its own. The company calls it a sport tourer, but the R-Class is built on the same basic underpinnings as the new M-Class four-wheel drive. Mercedes say that it has fused the best design elements of an MPV, SUV, sporty saloon and estate car into one all-new vehicle. The R-Class will seat six people in considerable comfort in three rows of captain-style chairs. Mercedes wanted to make the point that the R-Class is a luxury crossover, not a van, and so it resisted any temptation to stick a third seat in the middle or back row. As a result, all the occupants have plenty of shoulder and elbow room. And because the R-Class is actually a bit longer than the current long wheelbase S-Class sedan, legroom is outstanding in all three rows. The powertrain under that swoopy, boxy bodywork also comes from the next generation M-Class off-roader, so there's plenty of ground clearance and the driving position is commanding in true SUV fashion. It's not meant to be an off-roader, but it will do a better job of getting out of the mire than a regular saloon or estate car. Performance certainly won't be an issue for buyers ordering the 5-litre V8 R500. This aging but still potent engine will get the R-Class to 100 km an hour in just 7 seconds and on to a top speed of over 240 km an hour. There's also a less powerful V6 R350. The standard gearbox is a seven-speed automatic, but drivers can select gears manually with F1-style buttons on the steering wheel. For those looking for heavyweight performance, AMG will introduce a hyperpower V8 version soon. Options include an extra-large panorama sunroof, an entertainment system with dual screens in the backs of the front headrests, swiveling by xenon headlamps, a power tailgate, keyless ignition, 19 or 20-inch wheels, and that air suspension system that can lift the vehicle by 50 millimeters at low speed and automatically drops it 20 millimeters at high speed. The R-Class models will be built alongside the new M-Class in Merck's plant in Birmingham, Alabama, in America. It's a Benz gym, but not as we know it. So whether you're in traffic, getting into the wall, or just taking to the air, so you stay on track and up to speed, make sure you catch next week's Drive. <laughs>